let me start by asking why you know, Google care about making open models. Like we have a closed version, Gemini. Uh, by doing that, we are releasing IPs, helping our competitors, and uh, you know, giving away for free uh, compute. So uh, it's kind of a weird uh, uh, project we started there. Well, the main reason why we went there is because, uh, as it happens, the open uh, market is pretty big. Um, that's where th most of the developers are, and we want to help them where they are. Like, we want to provide tools to the people uh, that are building with AI. We, want, uh, we, we don't want only a few actors to be uh, dominant and, 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 and guide where things are going. We want any students, any uh, AI enthusiast to be able to have uh, AI in their pocket and, and try to do what they want to do and build whatever, whatever they want with that. Um, this seems maybe vague, but that's actually the principles we used to develop this project. Like it was really at the core of our thinking and, 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 where we, uh, uh, and, and how we, we shape our models. Like to illustrate that, um, I can show the, the type of the, the, the thinking that went into uh, the size of model we released. Like we released three, three categories of models. Uh, uh, 2B models, 9B models, and 27B models. Like these sides were decided arbitrarily. They were decided because we were aiming for different platforms that we knew AI developers uh, we like to have, like mobiles so that you can develop your mobile app uh, uh, easily, uh, laptops so that AI enthusiasts who just want to hack stuff at the, on, in their home can play with it, as well as high-end GPUs and GPUs, but single one, so that you know you can you can build your own station and just you know, uh, go for a slightly more advanced adventure. But like, we never try to go for like, you know, bigger model or anything that uh, someone cannot run. Like it's, we really put in, in, our, in our mind that notion of we, we are developing this AI for the developers, and we need, it, we need to, to meet them where they are. So a little bit in the spirit of this project, during this talk where I'm trying to to focus the most is not so much on trying to sell you these this models. Uh, you know, you can try them and I think, you know, they would sell themselves. I would just focus on how we train them, like giving you a little bit of the secret sauce, like giving you a way in a more IP, uh, so that it inspires you in the way you're going to build your own model, or like use these ones uh, the way you want. So, first of all, let me just give a very broad overview of how these models are trained. Like, you take, your, you, you take a huge corpus of data, and you train your model by you know, learning this corpus of data. That's called the pre-training. Uh, this is the most expensive phase. This is where you go over trillions and trillions of tokens of the world. Um, and then you take this model that has learned about all the internet, like all human knowledge on the internet, and then you make it usable by human, which in a phase which is called post-training. That's where you align the model with the user preference, like where you, you make it useful, answering questions, uh, being able to answer in a polite way, and so on. That's the second phase, post-training. I'm going to focus in this talk on pre-training, because that's my specialty, and that's usually the places where people have less knowledge. Um, and, I'll give, and I'll give away how we did it in, in Gemini and how it differs from any other models that were made before. Um, so first, let me explain a little bit more in details how pre-training works. So you go over, you go over the whole internet, you see uh, documents, let's say like this one, uh, the dog is, and then you ask the model to try to predict what's the next world, okay? Just giving these three words, it adds to guess the next world, right? It has a vocabulary of words, like small, blue, brown, white, tree, and among all these words, it has to make a prediction. So it's going to make a prediction by uh, outputting a probability for each of these worlds. It's going to say maybe brown is the most likely with 20% chance of being the next world, and then small and so on. And then we reveal the truth, the thing that is in the text. And uh, that thing will just point to one world, let's say brown, which was the correct one. So then in this world, we are going to put up its probability. Say, okay, this world was the highest prob higher probability than we, we thought. Now, what, by doing that, since probability sums to one, we are still pushing all the other probabilities towards zeros. And that doesn't really seem right, right? Like, I mean, if you only have the dog is as your context, like small 
or brown, or even blue to some extent, doesn't seem such a bad answer. Like, we shouldn't put them to zero, right? That's, that's, that's not like what the model should be learning. It should be learning something that is not the truth in your document. So in some sense, and that is one of the mistakes that we make when we train the LLMs, is that the truth is not the best answer. Like, you shouldn't use the truth. That is just going to give you uh, errors, and you are just going to push the things in the wrong directions. What you want, probably, looks more like this. Like, the best possible thing you will have is a probability distribution as well. It's something that tells you, going, like knowing what I know about uh, uh, the sentence, which is just the dog is, the optimal solution is the probability distribution. Something that tells you, when I see these three worlds, 50% of the time, the next world is brown. And 10% of the time, the next world is small and so on, and so on, and so on. Like, that is really what you want. It's not the text. The text is just an approximation of that. And, and so the question, really, is how do we know this best answer? Like, how can we construct it? Um, well, unfortunately, we can't. That's, that's the uh, sadness and why people are using this true uh, 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 solution. But maybe we can have a better solution than the one uh, than the one that is in the text. And this is what we use in Gemma. What we use is we took a much bigger model, a model that trained on so much text that I've learned so much about the world and so on. So like, you know, a model like the size of Gemini or, or GPT-4. And we ask that model to output a probability of words. And this model, because we know it works well, we know it's going to generate good text and so on, is probably a better approximation of that distribution than the, the, the one just coming from the text. So now we use that, that probability, which is there, and we use it to, get, to guide our models. Like, it's not perfect because it's coming from another model, but at the very least, it is a probability distribution that gives you that sense of, uh, after, depending on the context, you don't have a single answer. And so now, with this type of things, you will have a very different behavior when you're training. Like, it's just going to try to align the probability more, less aggressively, you will learn faster, and uh, uh, you will learn faster and, 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 and much more efficiently. Uh, now, that's kind of important when you train small models, because when you train small models, it's very, very, it, takes a, it takes forever to make them converge, and usually, after a certain number of, of, of tokens, they don't learn anymore. So the more you can get, uh, uh, the more you can get information out of them, as you train uh, them on each every individual token, the, more, uh, the better your model is going to be. Just to illustrate that, uh, let me give you some numbers on the number of like, optimal, uh, what we found to be kind of optimal number of tokens for each of the size, like the, the amount of tokens which after that, the gain were almost uh, equal to zero. So for a 27B, you have 13 trillion tokens, like you can train on up to 13 trillion tokens, maybe 15, like if you optimize a bit better, but that's a pretty huge, I'm one of corpus, so you can really have the time to learn. But when you go to a 2B models, like what we found is that past 8 trillion tokens, you really don't learn that much anymore. Like your model is at capacity. It has learned as much as it can, right? And, and same for 2B models. Like 2 trillion tokens is basically the mo the, uh, among the, 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 the biggest size you can go for. So you really want for each of these tokens to get as much information as you can so that it really, really end up in a good position. Now, what, what, what did we do for post-training? Well, we basically did exactly the same thing. Um, post-training, as I said, was aligning a, a model with the humans. And we used exactly the same approach in a slightly different fashion that I'm not going to describe here, um, but which is also taking a teacher, so a bigger model, and taking that model to guide the answer of the, of the, of the small model. With the only difference, that here, instead of uh, changing a text that exists, because when you do post-training, usually you just check how a model answers questions, we let the student models answer questions and make the teacher correct its answers, which is a slightly different approach, but with the same spirit. So all that put together, when we released the model, which was in July, we ended up with the, our biggest model being on top of the LMCs. So for those who don't know LMCs, it is the uh, 
gold standard for a uh, 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 language model, which were, uh, uh, so at the time, we are still far away from GPT-O, obviously, uh, but we were able, like Lama 370B, and very close to most of the, of the closed model, which were of size two or three times bigger. Um, and that is really because in that model, which, was, which has a small size, we actually had much more information about uh, uh, the model kind of learned to behave like a bigger model. Similarly, for our smallest model, the 2B model, we managed to get the best on device models, and by a huge margin. And again, it's because all the knowledge that this model had weren't just a 2B model. It was a 2B model that was trying to replicate what a teacher, a, a, a huge teacher, were doing. Um, and as I said, these 2B models, you can run it on your phone, uh, play, play with it, uh, ask questions, and so on. Uh, it, really, it is really optimized so that you can run, uh, run them there. All right. So I've talked a little bit about the, the performance of the model and so on. But the thing is, you can't, in the world of LNMs now, you can't just you know, push performance without you know, uh, taking care of, of uh, how you, your model behaves, especially uh, when you, you release models from big institutions like Google or Meta. And so safety was one of the big, uh, big aspects also for, uh, of our training. And I want to just spend a little bit of time to explain how we did it so that if people build also LLMs, get a little bit of a sense of how you can do it. I think there is two major ways uh, you should check for your safety on your models. So the first one is by filtering your pre-trained data. A lot of people forget to do that. If you train your models, usually people take as much data as they can, like whatever the source is as. And the problem with that approach is uh, what you put in your model, your model will learn it. So your, if your data is of very bad quality, um, you are going to end up with a model that is able to generate very bad quality data. Now, you don't want to remove all the bad quality data because your model also needs to learn what is bad quality data. So there is really a balance here to be found uh, and filtering just enough so that your model doesn't uh, uh, end up being, uh, having bad behaviors. Uh, in that process, we also remove any type of data that, is, uh, with, that has a license incompatible with open sourcing. Uh, we remove opt-out sites. We basically remove everything that is, uh, uh, that is not uh, uh, compliant with uh, open models that can be used with a commercial license. The second stage where you, you, push, you need to push safety is during the post-training side. It's when you align with a human. And this is the most important one. This is the one where you should spend the most time is, and, and, and not underestimate the complexity of it. So how, how usually you do this? You build a data set or you, build, uh, you, you make people try the models and make it try to say awful things and then annotate all these cases and correct the model. Now, the difficulty here is there is always a very simple answer to which your model can look very safe. It's by never answering anything. So you need to find a balance when you do this process of making your model safe to be on one hand safe, but on the other hand sa uh, um, um, uh, useful. And that balance is extremely hard to, uh, to, um, uh, to get. Finally, the other things that we released with the, the model, again, to help the developers, is a set of tools that we also use internally with any of our models. Like, even if you, tr because if, even if you try to make your model as safe as possible, by doing what I just said, your model is still going to make, uh, uh, to sometimes, in some cases, say something that it shouldn't say. Uh, or it can, de it, um, uh, it can fail to detect a question that shouldn't be answered, and so, and so on. So usually, on top of models that are deployed, we put a set of tools that uh, allows you to either understand why your model did that, or also identify when your model did do that and, 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 and trigger uh, uh, some, um, some classifier that tells you, okay, don't, uh, don't let the, mo the model answer in that, cases. So, in that case. So these type of things, we are also releasing them so that people who want to deploy these models can use tools in order to, uh, um, in order to build safely the models. Um, now that I've covered a bit the models, let me just 
give you a bit of a, still sell a little bit the models and, and give you a, 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 an idea of like, the impact it had, because uh, I think it was, I was pretty happy about that. So we call it uh, the Gemaverse. Uh, I mean, the PM call it this way. And um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I don't come up with a name, neither shield uh, Gemma. Um, but yeah, basically, out of, uh, uh, since we released the model, we had a lot of models built on top of them. Like, we had a really big community building uh, across it, other LLMs, but also tools using LLMs as one of their building blocks. Uh, if, you go, if you go on, a, on a Hugging Face, you see, uh, if you tap Gemma, the first, the first thing is not even our model. Um, so, yeah, there's a tons, tons of, uh, tons of uh, uh, derivative that has been built. Some of them now on the LMC system has been beating us, so, which is kind of annoying because it means they, the uh, uh, academic people manage to make better post training than we do. But that's also the spirit of open source, is we give them uh, the models, and then they can show us how we can improve even internally our models. Uh, over, since the release, which was uh, a bit less than six months, we had more than 20 million downloads, I think only on a Hugging Face uh, uh, platform. Um, and uh, uh, much more if you go over uh, Olama and all these type of things. So we are seeing a lot, uh, uh, a growing community uh, across these models. Uh, the main use case we found, uh, if you are interested in using them, a lot their, the cap their capabilities in multilingualities, in role playing, uh, and in general in, a, in a knowledge, uh, especially for the biggest model. Uh, I conclude my talk by, by giving you a, set, a large variety of the, of, the, um, of the platform where you can find these models. They are all across, like we are re really trying to, to put them everywhere. We don't want, as I said at the beginning, our goal is really to put this model in the end, in the end of everyone's. It's not like, a, oh, if you want to use these open models, you have to be on, on Google uh, stuff. First, because I'm pretty sure mo all the Google stuff that are here, you don't know which ones are Google, from Google and which ones are not. Uh, for example, Keras is from Google. Like, I didn't know that before joining Google. Um, so we try as much as possible to, to put that everywhere. Again, face, of course, NVIDIA. Um, so yeah, even AWS competitors and so on. Yeah, like, that's really the mission of our project. And, um, and thank you. <laughs>